Morning, church. Morning. God is good. Yes. All the time. God is good. Amen. You know, um, we live in a world where um, broken things, worn out things, and damaged things, and those things that we deem no longer useful to us, you know, we tend to throw them away, right? They're useless. So we throw it away. And frankly and quite sadly, my dear brethren and friends, those who are uh, watching us in Zoom as well, um, that is somehow the same in our human relationships. You know, a one classic example is our relationship in our marriage and in our relationship with our family. Um, instead of trying so hard to put the pieces right back together and make it work, we throw it away. You know, we, we throw it away by not talking to each other, thinking that it will go away and it will heal on its own. We don't talk to our spouses. We don't talk to our children. We don't talk to our friends. We throw it away um, by not forgiving each other. We throw it away by holding on and cuddling and embracing the hurt rather than focus on what heals the wound. We throw it all the way, all the way by putting our pride in the pedestal instead of bowing down in humility. We throw it away by taking another person in the relationship, you know, doing away with our spouses. Now, instead of getting back, at each other's arms. In our brokenness, oftentimes we want the easy way out. As they say, we want the quick fix. Okay. Now, do you know why broken people want to kill themselves by committing suicide? You know what's the reason behind why they want to end their life through suicide? It is not because, or it's not about killing themselves. It's not about it. It is about killing the pain. Now, in the process of killing the pain, their life becomes equilateral damage that they are willing to sacrifice to let go of the pain. And thinking as such, it is common to hear, especially when someone is being laid to rest, it is common phrase to hear no more pain, right? no more pain. He or she is now at rest. He or she is now at peace. Thank God, no more pain. For a faithful man and woman of the Lord, that's true, that's true. But for the unfaithful, it's a totally different story. Now, they think that they can escape the pain in this world through death. But soon they will discover what pain this really is in the afterlife. They will soon discover that indeed hell is real. And today we will talk about this topic. Beauty in brokenness. And indeed, we can find beauty in our brokenness. And I hope that at the end of this uh, worship this morning, despite of our own brokenness, despite of our own struggle, we can see that we are blessed by God. But we can see and we can see that there is beauty in our brokenness. In general, brokenness, it means a person in extreme anguish of heart or spirit brought about by sin, brought about by loss of someone, or brought about by a tragic experience. We all at some point, we all have been broken. Yes? Right? And some probably more than the others. And some probably heavier than the others. Right? Now, whatever kind of brokenness a man undergoes, it wins us. You know, it left us depleted. It takes the breath out of us. 
making us feel useless and making us feel inadequate, and sometimes make us feel hopeless. And this thought will sink into us that leads to many to mental health issues. Right? And this has a paralyzing effect in all of us. Paralyzing effect, it means that it hinders, it hinders your ability to enjoy God's blessings of life. It hinders my ability to enjoy what is out there, to enjoy my family. It hinders me to enjoy to see my children grow and to see my grandchildren, right? And to enjoy whatever there is left for us to enjoy. Now, there's an old adage that says there is no atheist in the foxholes. Now, many years ago, there's this young man uh, who grew up, never did believe in God. And uh, his parents never even bothered to mention God to him. They never prayed together. They never opened the Bible. They, they never go to church. They never talk about God. They never talk about Jesus. And this young man, he lived a, a, a luxurious life, you know, thanks to his grandparents. His grandparents was a self-made millionaire. And when the grandparents died, the parents of this young man took over. And they continued the legacy. Now, this family, again, they, they never had God in their lips. Okay? In all what they accomplish, it's all about them. It's never, it's never about God. God is nowhere near to them. <clears throat> then one day, this young man got sick. He got sick. And love after love after love, finally they discovered that this young man have a bone cancer. Okay. And uh, because of their wealth, he was uh, put in the uh, uh, Class A hospital, if I may put it. And uh, the doctors, all well-known doctors from across the globe came you know, to help this young man. But unfortunately, the doctors gave up. And the doctors called the parents, and the, and the doctors told the parents, there is nothing more that we can do. So we'll just have to wait. And then the doctor um, went to the young man, and they asked the young man. They asked the young man if he prays to God. And the young man said, no. And the doctor told him, it is high time that you should start praying to God for a miracle. And uh, lo and behold, the family, for the first time in their life, in that room in the hospital, they all held hands, the three of them, the father, the mother, and the son. Then they kneeled down to God. They prayed to God. They cried out to God for the first time in their life. God was in their lips. They cried to God for mercy. They cried to God for forgiveness. They cried to God for another chance in life for their, ship, for their son. And God, being the God that he is, gave them their prayers. And that man was healed. And he was cleared of cancer. And uh, as the saying goes, they live happily ever after alongside God. Now, <clears throat> another classic story is the, the war at Stalingrad in Russia. Okay. Um, in Stalingrad, Stalingrad is an um, industrial area in, in Russia at that time. And many Germans, actually Hitler wanted to conquer Russia by, by getting into Stalingrad. And the Germans were sent to Stalingrad to conquer Stalingrad. But unfortunately, they starved to death. They ran out of food and they were killed by the Russians. And it was a tragic loss to the Germans. Now, why did I say all of these things? When you are in a fax hole, two things will happen. Number one, you will begin 
questioning your faith and the existence of God. Now, like the Germans, they did just that. They questioned their faith. They questioned the existence of God in the battlefield. They asked, where is God in all of this? Why God allowed this to happen? And many abandoned their faith. Many abandoned God. Now, number two that will happen is that you will find solace. You will find solace. You will find comfort. You will find peace with God. Many of those captured uh, by the Russians, many of those Germans found just that as well. They found peace. They found God in the war. With their backs turned against the walls and death was inevitable, they all turned to God. Many Germans turned to God and found peace with God before they died. Now, our journey in life at some point will take us to brokenness. Now, when that happens, even the strongest of faith might wonder, where is God in all of this? Again, how we respond to this is the most important part. How you respond to your brokenness is the most important part. It's either number one, you remain broken, or number two, you find God in your brokenness and be blessed. It's all up to you. Now, a, a wonderful news to all of us, broken, wonderful news to all of us, hurting. You know, God wants to restore you. God wants to save you. You believe that? You believe that? Can I get an amen? Amen. In Psalm chapter 34, verse 18, the Bible said, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. Wow. God is close to you. God is close to you. Brokenhearted people. And it says there, and saves the crush in the spirit. So the Lord wants to restore you. The Lord wants to save you. And he wants to use you. So it's a matter of choice. It's a matter of choice. God wants to heal your brokenness. Whatever that you are going through right now, God wants to heal you and save you. But it's up to all of us if we allow him to. Now, when we choose to remain broken, then nothing God can do because we shut the door to him. He cannot do anything because you, you don't let him do. You don't allow him to. But if we choose to see God and take the chance, or as we say, take that lift of faith with him, you know, we can see great things happening. We can start seeing beauty. We can start seeing being blessed by God in our brokenness. Now, if we find ourselves broken, I want all of us to, to remember this. There's, a, there's a, uh, a Japanese art called Kintsugi. I don't know if you know this. Uh, it's a Japanese art. Kintsugi, it means joining together, putting together with gold. <laughs> with gold. As you can see, those are gold. Okay. So Kintsugi means joining with gold. It is an art of joining together broken pottery using flakes of gold, lacquer, you know, lacquer dusted or mixed with gold. The intention is not to hide the imperfections. No, that is not the purpose. That is not the intention. The intention is to highlight the imperfections. Okay. In the hands of a skilled Kintsugi master, the once broken pottery, it takes on a new look. It takes on a, a, a new look and even become more beautiful and elegant than its original look. Now, even with the obvious, as you can see, even with the obvious imperfections, uh, those patterns, 
the imperfection now becomes the center of attraction. You will now be looking not at the pottery itself, but those imperfections that's lined with gold. So it now becomes the center of attraction. Now, in the hands of the Almighty, our master potter, if we allow him to, he will start to heal our brokenness. And he will start you putting, back, putting you back into pieces by, you know, uh, pasting you or joining you, not with silver, but with gold. But actually in the Bible, it is more than gold. It is the blood of Christ. Amen. It is the blood of Christ. Now, God will use your imperfection so that your brokenness, so that your brokenness, everybody will see how blessed you are and that everybody will see how awesome your God is. Now, despite how terrible and how ugly the situations were in our life, there will be something beautiful that will come out of it if we choose God, to let God mold you in our brokenness. Now remember that in our brokenness, it is a matter of choice. It is a matter of choice. Whether you remain broken or you find God. Now choosing to find God in your brokenness, my dear brothers and sisters, means you are giving all your hurt. Means you are giving all your frustrations to God. You are giving all your anger. And you are giving your hope. God. And you are allowing God to work in you and through you. And this, my brethren and friends, is what is meant by we delight in the Lord. In Psalm 37 verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, delight means to be soft. Again, it means to be soft, to be pliable. God called us to delight <clears throat> in him in his hands so that he can shape us, mold us into whatever ways he wants. So when we choose to find God in our brokenness, it means that we are focused now on God. It means now we are now delighting in God. Again, delighting means you become pliable with God. It means that you become soft, that God can mold you in whatever ways he wants in your life. So when you find yourself in, in hurt or in pain, in brokenness, then God said, delight in me. You delight in me. And when you look up to heaven and you delight in God, you allow God to work in you. And sooner or later, you will see the beauty in your brokenness. Now, when you choose to be happy in the Lord, be sure that we choose him because, you know, that God is God. Choose him because he is God. And that you believe in him. And that God knows what's the best for you. And just let him mold you in whatever ways he wants in your life. Now in the same way, like in the art of Kintsugi, in the hands of a, in the hands of a Kintsugi master, the outcome is a work of art. Now in the hands of our almighty, you will be beautiful beyond description. Amen. Can you tell the person beside you, you're beautiful. Amen. Do you believe the person that tells you that you're beautiful? <laughs> of course we are, right? Now, in our brokenness to blessedness, three things takes place. The three is, number one is encounter with God. Okay. Now, many observe that when a person is in his trying time, we tend to draw closer to God. Right? It was observed that when a person is broken, majority is that we tend closer to God. Now, why? It's because subconsciously, we realize that we cannot do anything. We realize, you know, that the current weight, the current situation, the weight that is on our shoulder is beyond our limit, beyond what we can bear. So we shout, help. 
And that is our subconscious mind telling us to look for help. And when you are broken, we turn to God for help because nothing works. Just like the story of the young man. Okay. Now, it is like our reflexes, muscle memory. If I will throw something to Brother Ryan, even if he's not looking at me, the tendency would be right, because of our muscle memory. See? And same thing, when you are broken, your subconscious reflexes, so to speak, will shout help. Now, there was this uh, man, he went to the gym, and uh, he went to the bench press, and he started to warm up, then lie down on the bench press, and then he'll do his chest workout. And then uh, on his third uh, set, another man that, that was close to him, he noticed that, you know, that the weights are too heavy for him. And this young, this another guy approached this man on the bench. He asked, do you need spotter? Right. It's a fail safe, you know. When you cannot carry anymore, then that person will help you lift the weight up. So you could, you know, do more repetitions. So this guy, no, I can do it. Thank you. And then on his uh, second repetitions, then third, and then on his fourth repetitions, he cannot lift the weight anymore. And then he shout, help. <laughs> so the other guy rushed to him and helped him out. You see, you know, you know, the problem is, the problem is, my dear brothers and sisters, sometimes our ego, my ego, that is embedded in us, you know, doesn't want any help. Doesn't want to seek God. And when that happens, we run into some serious troubles. You know, there will be time, trust me, there will be time for your own strength. There will be time. But there will be time also that when you needed divine intervention, that you needed God in your brokenness. When Apostle Paul was nearing Damascus to persecute the followers of Jesus in Acts chapter 9, suddenly a light from heaven flashed and blinded him temporarily. Now at this time, at this point in, in, in Paul's life, you know, Paul cannot do anything. Even his companion. He cannot see. Now the blindness of Paul was meant to awaken his insufficiency. Let me repeat that. The blindness of Paul was meant to awaken his insufficiency to heal himself. You know, Apostle Paul, he was connected in the government. He knows people in the high ranks. And he was affluent. But with all those connections with his money, he cannot get himself healed. He cannot get himself to see. It needed divine interve intervention. Now, in his transformation towards blessedness, you know, Paul encountered God. Paul encountered God in the like manner in our weakness, in our brokenness. Many find themselves facing God. In the scripture reading, Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28, I know many of you, this is your go-to verse like me, when I had my depression many years back, when I had my anxiety, when I almost lost my sanity. <laughs> this, is, this is one of those go-to verse. Matthew 11, 28, 29, and 30. Now, Jesus said, come to me. Come to me. It is a genuine invitation from our Lord of rest, Jesus Christ, to come to him. And it's a once-in-a-lifetime encounter with him. When he called his very first disciples, Jesus said, come to me. Come follow me. Jesus wants them to encounter him. And when you are down in your life, 
When you are worn out, when you are broken, I want you to remember this. Jesus said, come to me. Jesus said, you are not alone in your battle. You are not alone in your brokenness. Jesus said, come to me. The next E is experience God. God wants you not only to encounter him, but in your encounter with him, God wants you to experience him. You know, when we truly heed the invitation of Jesus, when we truly come to Jesus, our lives will never be the same. I truly believe that there's no true encounter with God that lives are still the same. Life will never be the same. We cannot come to God and encounter God and cannot be changed. No. When you come to God, when you encounter God, and when you experience God, I know that God will change you. Because as we encounter God, we come to know Him more and more. And as we come to know Him more and more, we experience His sovereignty. When Paul encountered God on his way, on the road to Damascus, his life was changed forever. You know, God showed Paul who he is. God showed Paul who God is. And God let experience, uh, God let Paul experience his true nature of being God. Now, in, in that point, now listen to what Paul had to say in experience with God in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1, 13 to 16. Look at this. Listen to this. Even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ, in my insolence, I persecuted these people, but God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. He filled me with the faith and love that come from Christ Jesus. This is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners and I am the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. Amen. You know, just reading those words gives me chills, gives me goosebumps. You know, Paul not only encountered God, but Paul experienced Jesus. Paul experienced Jesus. Can I just go back? Paul experienced God's mercy. Paul experienced the generosity of God. Paul experienced the graciousness of God, the love of God. And Paul experienced the salvation that God wanted to give to him and to all of you. Again, he said, mercy. He experienced mercy. And he experienced the great patience of God. The Bible said, not anyone, not wanting anyone to perish, but come into repentance. God does not want you. God does not want me to perish. God does not want you to be broken down all your life. No. God wants you to be fixed, to be restored so that you can have heaven just like Paul. <clears throat> and at the end, Paul said, receive eternal life. <clears throat> Again, going back in Matthew, 20, Matthew 11. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. As we all come to God, as we all come to Jesus Christ, as we all encounter him, Jesus wants all of us to experience him. He wants you to experience his rest. Now, what kind of rest is Jesus really talking about here? It is rest from the burden of sin, which only Jesus can give. That's why Jesus said, come to me and I will. The I was emphasized in the scripture. It was, it was emphasized because only Jesus can heal you. Only Jesus 
can give you rest. Nobody else can. And then Jesus wants you to have peace. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Now, here's an interesting part, brethren and friends. Now, Jesus wants us to have rest, right? He told us, come to me and I will give you rest. Now, the following verse, the following verse, it says there, take my yoke upon you. Hmm. Isn't that counterintuitive? Counterproductive? Jesus wants you to have rest, and then Jesus is telling you, you know, take my yoke. Wait a minute, Jesus. Do you want me to, to rest or... Do you want me to do some labor for you? Right? Do you want me to take the yoke, your yoke, and put it on my shoulder? Which is which, really? Right? Now, a yoke is a wooden cross piece that is fastened over the necks of two animals. By general definition, it is fastened over two animals attached to the claw or cart that they are to pull. Now, I want all of us to take notice of this. Again, a yoke is fastened over two animals, joining them together. Now, here is what Jesus wants us to do. He wants us first to take out our own yoke. To take, for example, this is, this is me. <laughs> This is me. Jesus wants me to take that yoke, okay? To take off, take it off, okay? And, you know, those yoke, Jesus wants you to get rid of that yoke, to free ourselves from other things that hold us. And these are our own slavery. These are Satan's scheme. These are our pain. These are our heartaches, our frustrations, our sins, our own futile way. And all that entangles us so we cannot enjoy life and God's blessing. So God wants me to take those away. Now, Jesus said, again, take it away. Throw it away. Now, you know why Jesus wants us to throw those things away? You know why? Because those things don't really work. Your way don't really work. That's why we are broken. That's why we cannot move on. There's a movie, shortly, there's a movie, Grid Iron Gun, by Dwayne The Rock Johnson. And it's a, it's a juvenile prison where all the juveniles, they were put in that uh, juvenile prison. And Dwayne told the, the juveniles, the reason why you are here, because you are all losers, because of your own way. Now, if you listen to me, if you do my way, then you'll become winners. That's why you are here because of your own way. Your own way doesn't work. And Jesus wants us to take our yoke away because our way doesn't work. If it does, then we don't need Jesus. Right? If your way works, you don't need Jesus. But our way doesn't work. Our way leads us to our sins. Our way leads us to our brokenness. So that's why Jesus wants us to take that yoke away from us because it doesn't really work. Now, second, by getting rid of our yoke, Jesus wants us now to put his yoke. Now, you're getting the point? You remove your own yoke. Now, Jesus wants you to put his yoke on you. Now, what's happening here? What is happening? You will have to replace your old yoke, those things that wear you down, your frustrations, your sins, your old ways that doesn't really work with a new one. Jesus wants you to put on a new one. And this new one is the yoke of Jesus, which according to Jesus himself, my 
Maar Job is easy. It's easy. Your Job, my Job is hard. You get the point, right? Now, remember, remember, Job is joining two animals together. Okay. Now, another cool thing that is happening here, when we put on Jesus' yoke, we are now attached to Jesus. Amen. You are now attached to Jesus. Or vice versa, Jesus now is attached to you. You are now joined together. Now, what does this mean? You now have Jesus helping you. You now have Jesus helping you carry your loads with you because, you know why? Because he cares for you. Hallelujah. Because Jesus cares for you. Give all your worries and cares to God for he cares about you. Now, the fourth, Jesus said, my burden is light. Right? My burden is light. When we experience God's mercy, when we experience God's love, God's forgiveness, God's rest, God's patience, God's healing and faithfulness, following Jesus will be a walk in the park. But there will be some humps and bumps along the way. But it will be easy. He said it will be light. Now comparing it, when you have your yoke, when you are yoked, when you are yoked together, joined together with the world. Remember, when you are yoked, you are joined to another. When you are yoked in your old self, you are yoked to the world, to the sin. That's why it's hard for us to move on. That's why it's hard for us to get back. Because we are entangled in our sins into the world. Now, if ever we make it, Soon, we will find again ourselves back in the ditch, back in the mud. It's like a cycle of never-ending misery, a cycle of never-ending brokenness because we are yoked in this world. That's why many don't make it because the yoke that attached to them and the cart, the cart that they are pulling is too heavy. It's too heavy because you have the world, you have the sins of the world. It's too heavy for you. It wears you down until we don't have any strength anymore to get up. But not with Jesus. He tells us his burden is light. In John chapter, 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, loving God means keeping his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. His commandments, they are light. They are light. And he made it even lighter. You know why? Because he is with you. He is now with you pulling the cart. You are not alone pulling the cart behind you. He will make sure that you will make it true. And you will make it true. Because of your genuine love for God. You will not be left alone by God. And the number three, letter E, is embrace God. Now after Paul experienced that Grace and mercy of God, he embraced God by embracing his new life with God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Galatians 2.20 His new life in Christ is that Christ is now living in Paul. Paul is now one with Jesus. And I want all of us to be one with Jesus. His life, Paul's life, is now about Christ. It's not about himself. It is about Christ. It is now about whatever pleases God. That is the new life of Paul that he embraces. And we must do the same. Now, Paul embraces new life, and he also embraces his new mission. The new mission God has in store for him. You see, notice Paul responds to Jesus. In Acts 22, verse 10, What shall I do, Lord? I ask. Paul asked, Lord, what shall I do? 
When Paul experienced Jesus Christ, the mercy, love, forgiveness of Christ, he then asked God, Lord, what shall I do? He is now embracing a new mission in life. His new mission. Jesus said, now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant. Paul is now embracing this new mission of his with Christ. He is now a servant, a witness of what you have seen and I will see of you and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes. Paul's mission is now to open the eyes of the Gentile world and turn them from darkness to light. He once persecuted the church and now he is now championing the church. And from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and place among those who are sanctified by faith. You know, from a wretched man and a broken man to a fearless servant of Christ, Paul's life becomes a blessing to many. Until now, we are talking about Paul. He fearlessly preached the gospel of Christ in the heart of Rome, defying all odds. He advanced the church of Christ. Then he went on to write 13 of the New Testament books in the Bible. Then he was martyred. Now, if we will just open our eyes, my dear brothers, sisters, and friends, our brokenness is meant for blessing. Our master potter, our God Almighty, is molding, is shaping us from our imperfections to perfections so that others might see in us the glory of our King. Your brokenness is not the end of your life. My brokenness is not the end of my life but a means to find the real meaning in life. Your brokenness is not the end of your happiness, but the start of blessedness. And that is finding God in the midst of your hurt and in brokenness. It is my hope and prayer that beyond the pain of brokenness, we can see the beauty of blessedness because of God. Now, before I go down, can I sing a song? Or can, can we sing a song? Just a, a portion. I've learned this way, way back. Even before when I accepted the Lord. A pep song, as they say. He's still working on me. I've learned this way, way back. Now it says, He's still working on me. To make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be. Was he still working on me? In the mirror of his words, reflections that I see, makes me wonder why he never gave up on me. But he loves me as I am and helps me when I pray. Remember his the potter, I am the clay. Yeah. Yes, sir. For those who have not yet accepted Jesus, don't waste your life. Don't wait to be in the foxholes to see God. You might not get out of the foxhole. Now come to God and allow God to use you mightily in his kingdom. God be forever be praised and shall we all stand as we sing the song of the vision.